In 1895, Japan acquired Taiwan Island from the Qing Empire as their first colony. For the next 50 years, Japan occupied Taiwan, infusing it with their traditions, culture, and expertise. The colonial legacy of the Japanese occupation period was deep and long-lasting for both colonized and colonizer. In this video, we're going to talk about what happened during those 50 years and what it did for both the Taiwanese and Japanese people. But first, the Asianometry Patreon. I'll make it quick. Early access members get to see new videos and selected references for them before they're released to the public. It's not a lot of money, and I appreciate the support. Thanks, and on with the show. When the Japanese took over Taiwan, the island's economy under Qing government rule can be best described as primarily agrarian with a few exports. In the 1860s, the Western powers added the ports of Damsui and Anping as treaty ports. With this, Taiwan managed to develop a small export market for Taiwanese camphor and teas. Despite this, the majority of the population farmed for themselves. In general, there was little infrastructure, education, and economic development. Public health measures had not yet been implemented, Taiwanese weather is tropical and mosquitoes are rampant, so diseases like malaria regularly sapped people's productivity. Japan's vision for Taiwan was to be its agricultural appendage. Taiwan would grow and supply Japan with food and raw materials, starting with sugar and rice. Why sugar? Japanese sugar consumption started to rapidly grow after the Russo-Japanese War in 1905. Companies like Morinaga and Meiji were producing Western candies, and Japanese people loved it. The government saw sugar as a crucial source of calories for white and blue-collar workers. Being able to import it without spending limited foreign currency was seen as crucial. The Japanese would invest a great deal of resources into Taiwan and its 2.8 million people, but first they had to pacify it. This required a brutal military campaign and an oppressive police state. When Japan first took control of the island in 1895, they arrested anybody interpreted to have committed acts against the state. They would often be charged as a bandit and executed. In 1895, executions rose from 54 the previous year to 282. From then on, the Japanese colonialists executed an average of 716 people a year for banditry. These tactics regularly led to more anti-colonial sentiments, and later colonial administrations turned away from this. Regardless, Taiwan remained a police state. The government employed one police patrolman for every 600 civilians, and patrols happened up to six times a day in crucial areas. Police often conducted regular search and seizures into households. The Han would eventually get on board with the program but the aboriginal population in Taiwan's central mountains would continue resistance activities for decades thereafter, with bloody and brutal results. With active anti-colonial resistance crushed by the mid-1900s, Japan set out to build up infrastructure and enforce reforms. They built up harbors and laid down railroads to connect them. By 1908, harbors in Jilong and Kaohsiung were connected via rail. They built mass irrigation projects and systems to control the periodic floods. Farmers needed banks and modern institutions to buy seeds and their goods. There were none at the turn of the century, but by 1920, there were five modern banks with 50 branch offices. Along with them were 400 credit cooperatives dotted across the island. And critically, they established land rights and ownership. This is harder than you might expect. It means settling boundary conflicts and wild claims between neighboring landowners. Ten years before the colonization, the Qing had spent 426,635 ounces of silver to identify relevant landowners, but they never tracked sales and purchases. The Japanese government spent 4.2 million ounces of silver to update their records and add this record-keeping feature. The cost of doing this was not insignificant. The Taiwan government's total budget spending at the time was 1 million ounces of silver each year, but it unlocked two powerful revenue sources. First, people knew that they could invest in their land, knowing that it was theirs and they could reap the benefits. Second, the government can start generating land tax revenues from those landowners. This land tax revenue helped replace cash subsidies from the Japanese government back home. 
This channel has frequently covered how colonial rule affects the economies and lives of the people living in the colonized state. But it is just as interesting to consider how they affected the colonizer as well. Before World War I, agricultural output back in Japan was going along at a good pace. From 1890 to 1920, total production of rice, Japan's most important crop, grew at about 1.4% each year. This growth was driven by gains in both the area planted, 0.44%, and yield, 0.94%. So, Japanese farmers were not only growing more, they were getting better at growing what they had. These improvements were due to the removal of feudalism, Japanese farmers catching up to more modern growing techniques imported from the West, and the introduction of higher yielding seeds. However, this effect had largely vanished after the end of World War I. Then, in 1918, rice prices began to rise due to inflation and market speculation. These rising food prices caused social instability amongst the ordinary Japanese people. This instability culminated in the rice riot of 1918, an unprecedented modern Japanese event. It lasted from July to September 1918 and involved 66,000 protesters across 400-plus disturbances. The riots led to the resignation of Prime Minister Terauchi and his cabinet. Resolving not to let its urbanizing population go hungry, the new government looked to its colonies in Taiwan and Korea to generate rice surpluses to send back home. Taiwanese agriculture grew slowly at first, 1-2% to each year. The Taiwanese people were forced to replace rice in their diets with sweet potatoes to spare more for export back to Japan. But a 1920 annual output growth accelerated to 4%. This was due to infrastructure improvements and Japan transferring its agricultural knowledge to Taiwan. This included higher yielding rice strains and technologies like superior plows and a pedal-powered rice thresher. Japan bought Taiwan's goods with little competition, shielded by tariffs. In the 20 years from 1915 to 1935, Taiwan rice exports to Japan grew from 113,000 tons to 705,000 tons. By the late 1930s, 36% of Japan's rice imports and 92% of its sugar imports came from Taiwan. This is classic export-led growth, and it reminds me of New Zealand and the United Kingdom. The island's colonial relationship meant that the UK bought all of New Zealand's dairy goods at whatever cost, fueling decades of unprecedented growth. Over the next three decades, from 1911 to 1941, Taiwan GDP grew by about 19% each decade. This growth track record falls short of Japan's performance, which had been 26%, but far outclassed that of China across the strait. Japan's colonial rice import policy, implemented to solve an immediate problem, would have wide-ranging consequences in world history. It allowed the Japanese government to avoid urban turmoil without spending precious foreign capital, but at a cost to Japan's rural population. Rice prices collapsed, and the Japanese agricultural sector started to experience social disorder. The radicals in the Japanese military would eventually seize on this situation as a reason for the ill-advised invasion of Manchuria in 1931 and beyond. Economic growth on the whole is nice and all, but did that growth actually help the ordinary Taiwanese people? Objectively measured in a nutritional human health sense, the answer is yes. The public health measures alone, reducing malaria and other local epidemics, had long-lasting benefits for the native Taiwanese. In 1906, the life expectancy for the average Taiwanese at birth was about 29 years. By the 1936-1940 period, that life expectancy had risen to 45 years. The 1930s, prior to the war, saw plentiful amounts of food available to the Taiwanese. Agricultural output of beans, vegetables, and fruit tripled in the decade after the 1920s, fueled by Taiwan's Green Revolution. Japan also implemented a massive education drive. In 1917, just 13% of Taiwanese youths went to school. By the end of the Japanese regime, that had grown to 71%, and an incredible improvement. Most convincingly, historical records show that the average Taiwanese male got taller over the decades, 
driven by better eating, healthier living conditions, and education gains. The average Taiwanese male born in the 1880s was about 162 centimeters, or about 5 foot 4 inches. By the 1970s, that number was 171 centimeters, or about 5 foot 7 inches. In both cases, Taiwanese men were taller than their ancestral counterparts in Fujian and Guangdong. The greatest height gains, about 1.1 average centimeters per decade, came during the colonial period from the 1890s to the 1950s. These numbers are not comparative to other non-colonized developing countries of the period, but they do reflect the fact that life did get better for the colonized Han Chinese on Taiwan. The Japanese took their share, but the Taiwanese never experienced chronic hunger. At the same time we acknowledge the benefits of Japanese colonization on Taiwan, we need to point out the social inequalities. Like with Korea, Japan imported to Taiwan a great deal of its own people to staff the bureaucracy and run the colonial administration. Despite never taking up more than 6% of the total population, the Japanese occupied the best jobs. 20% of the managers, 30% of the clerks, 70% of the trained technicians, and 73% of the government staff. Importing such human labor had been necessary at the start. The efforts of these Japanese immigrants helped to infuse Taiwan with valuable human capital. For instance, Japanese agricultural technicians in Taiwanese agriculture. But over time, it eventually became the case that Taiwanese felt discriminated against, a secondary race in their own home. They wanted more equal treatment with the Japanese, perhaps even a form of home rule. But the activists were not quite sure about how to go about achieving it. Taiwanese activists agitated for local legislatures back in the homeland, invoking Japanese history and quote-unquote loyalty to Japan to make their case. But the colonial government was solidly against any form of home rule. These Taiwanese elites walked a fine line. Much of their wealth and position derived from the Japanese capitalist system. Delicately, they argued for increased Taiwanese participation in that system, but never questioned the system itself. These elites would largely fail and give rise to more radical efforts from the left. Leftists with more impoverished backgrounds sought to overthrow the colonial system itself. The colonial government repressed these efforts with a brutal hand. I did a video about one of these efforts, the Communist Party of Taiwan, and I recommend that you go check it out. In the end, it took Japan losing World War II for them to end their colonial occupation of Taiwan. However, the Taiwanese locals did not achieve their vision of home rule after the war's end, as the Chinese nationalists took over. But as they left, the Japanese colonials granted Taiwan one final gift, if you may call it that, and that was their land, industries, and possessions. As the nationalists arrived, they nationalized Japanese industrial enterprises like the sugar processing plants, the salt monopoly, and the tobacco-slash-alcohol monopoly. The Japanese scrambled to leave, selling over 30 billion NTD of their assets to Taiwanese at extremely low prices. Some of these deals created dynastic wealth. Lin Tzu of the Datong Steel Company bought over 50 houses and overnight became one of Taiwan's richest people. And Japanese holdings also contributed to a massive series of land reforms that supercharged agricultural output and set the stage for Taiwan's industrialization. While the Japanese had reformed the land ownership situation somewhat, they never abolished land tenancy. Over time, landlords got richer and richer due to high rents, predatory lending practices, and estate takeovers. Farmers found themselves working lands they could never own. 10% of landowners owned 60% of the arable land. By the end of the war, unrest in the rural areas had already started to cause issues. When the nationalists arrived, the new regime implemented a series of land reform measures to build up a political support base and demonstrate an alternate path from communism. With support and guidance from American economists, this land reform measure happened over three stages. Stage 1. In 1949, legislation was introduced to limit land rents to 37.5% of crop output. Stage 2. In 1951, the government sold off its public land bank directly to the people. Much of this 
Public Land Bank was acquired from former Japanese colonists. Any ordinary Taiwanese can buy a piece of this land bank, and many did. In 1948, 1951, and 1952, nearly 100,000 Taiwanese families bought a plot of land to farm. Many of these plots were very small, but these small sales triggered a big drop in land prices and helped prepare native landlords for what was to come next. Stage 3 a land to the tiller program. In 1953, the nationalist government expropriated all excess land from landlords with more than about three hectares. The government then sold this expropriated land to tenants for essentially nothing. 13% of Taiwan's GDP moved from one group of people's hands into another. Approximately 143,000 hectares transferred to 195,000 new owners an unprecedented reform. By 1970, 78% of Taiwanese farmers owned their own land. Landlords were compensated with bonds and stocks of some recently privatized state-owned enterprises, enterprises that the nationalist government seized from the departing Japanese. Those native Taiwanese elites turned from being mere landlords collecting passive income to industrialists with a stake in furthering Taiwan's industrial development and the farmers now got to own the land they worked on. One thing that I have frequently seen in economic history is that people work harder when it is their own land. Rice productivity rose, and agriculture advanced to more valuable goods like asparagus, mushrooms, and bananas. This generated value surpluses that could be reinvested into additional automation and industrialization. And the nationalists get to argue that their approach to land reform was superior to the communists. The success of their land reform policy cemented the mainlanders' economic legitimacy to rule, and their faction would govern Taiwan for decades thereafter. So, the whole thing was a win-win for everyone involved. Except, I guess, for the Japanese people who were shipped back home with virtually nothing. Today, exchanges between Japan and Taiwan are very warm, compared to those with its other former colony, Korea. The former Taiwanese president, Lee Dong-hui, was a particularly big fan, much to the consternation of the Kuomintang party that he used to lead. His death in 2020 triggered a Japanese delegation to pay their respects. Much of the infrastructure Japan built to develop Taiwan's economy is still there, and Taiwanese culture bears Japan's influence too. I have seen it described as a mix of Chinese and Japanese traits, and in many ways I have to agree. In general, Taiwanese today aren't as negative on the Japanese colonial era as one might expect, though I should mention that there also exists a comfort women issue here in Taiwan. Anyway, it's an interesting and complicated historical relationship. That's all I have for tonight. I dedicate this video to my late grandfather, who was born during the colonial era. He spoke better Japanese than Mandarin, but never failed to let me know I was loved. Thank you for everything. Subscribe to the channel, sign up for the newsletter, and I'll see you guys next time.